Welcome to Engaging the Supernatural, where we explore what God is saying to us today through signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm excited to have a roundtable discussion with three of my favorite people in the heaven near-death experience space. I've done multiple interviews uh, with each of these guys. Uh, John is the book uh, is the author. He's not a book. He's the author of, <laughs> of a best-selling book called Imagine Heaven. Uh, and between him and Randy, he were actually the two guys that really introduced me to the heaven and near-death experience space. I've had the honor of working on two different books with Randy. And I've, I've never worked on a book with you yet, but right. you've been on my podcast. So both of these guys have had near-death experiences. John and I are honorary members of the Near-Death Experience Club. And so we just want to have a roundtable discussion, and we're excited to see what God does with that today. John, I'll turn it over to you for the first question. Well, you know, I'm wondering, right now it seems like there are more and more and more of these near-death experiences like you guys have had coming to the forefront. Why do you think that is? I think that uh, the Lord wants to reveal uh, both heaven, but also his reality. And I think so many are more hopers than believers, right? Mm. That is, they hope that God really is God, yeah. that Jesus is real, and that heaven is our future in the afterlife as believers in Jesus. But I think what the Lord is doing today is he is such a heart after the lost mm. and after his, his uh, children that he wants to introduce them to his reality in such a way that it cannot be denied. Yeah. 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 I kind of agree with that. I also believe that it's, uh, I think it's time where people start seeing actual miracles and start hearing about it. Mm. And so and it's a miracle. Anybody that goes to an NDE, it's a miracle. You know, something yeah. happened, you know, they died, they, died. they went someplace yeah. and they came back. And yeah. I think, I think the world is ready to hear it now more than they ever were, you yeah. know, because they've gotten so far off into other things. They need to hear the pureness of what God has yeah. and what's waiting for them. Yeah, I think COVID really introduced uh, the large population in the world at large uh, to the possibility of dying. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that exposed even young people now to the potential reality of them not being uh, around tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I've I've come to believe it's really a, an apologetic in a global world, like it's God's gift to the not just the church but the whole globe. You know, we were talking about how some of these stories of of God's reality and what He's doing uh, it can make its way on a phone into Africa, Russia, India, you know, Nepal, anywhere, right? Right, right. and I think. And we, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. It couldn't have happened. And yet today, it, it's a possibility. And that's what I've been studying and realizing is God's doing this. Um, he is bringing people back from clinical death yes. to testify of his reality all over the world. And it's the same God that they're experiencing, even though that might not have been their expectation. Right. This God of light and love. That, as we know, you know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Yes. And they're seeing that, you know, right there. John, I had a question for you, please. And that is, you have researched this over a span of over 30 years, the topic, and thousands of people now. So I know they're the typical, the light, the tunnel, mm -hmm. and some of the other experiences. But can you uh, mention some of the more in depth experiences that people have, generally speaking, who are both believers in Christ and maybe those that are not. You mean, what are those like? Yes. Yeah. Any commonalities? Um, yeah. I mean, it, well, here, here's the first thing. They're all unique. And, and, you know, one of the things that, that hit me is um, there are commonalities, but God also welcomes his children just like we would welcome our, our children home and we know them and we know what they would love. My wife always you know, bakes a certain thing because she knows how much Ashley loves that, right? And you see that uniqueness as well. I don't know if you guys felt that, but I, I was thinking about um, uh, commercial airline pilot, Captain Dale Black, that I interviewed. So God welcomes him in and lets him fly in, <laughs> floating <laughs> in with two angels into the holy city to see from above. Um, Jim Woodford, he loves horses. He gets to pet horses and sees horses in, in heaven. You know, and it made me think of, you know, what was it, Psalm 30, 
7, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Yes. And, you know, that's, we don't get everything we want here on this earth, but I kind of wonder if that was like, it's coming. He knows our desires. And Sounds like it to me. Yeah. 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 We were just talking about that, Ivan, that, and that the very thing, because uh, we can have different experiences, but it's tailored by the Lord to what we need or what he wants to convey to us. Yeah. Uh, and your experience, I know Ivan being similar in some ways and, and not in other right. ways, different. Uh, but for me, I was an agnostic. I was a skeptic. I didn't believe in near-death experiences before <laughs> I had my own. And then uh, I had an intimacy with a Jesus that you had said, John, you know, I have to meet Dale Black because he and I both cry, you know, like babies when right. we start talking well, about Jesus. Well, most, most <laughs> do. That's the thing. That, yes. that, yeah. that, I mean, you've told me and others that to the memory is not a memory like here. It's a memory like here. Right. right. And it's just as real today as it was then. And so when you go there, you're in his presence is overwhelming. And I've heard that a lot. And heaven is more real yes. than this world. Yes. What, okay. Yes. So let me ask you guys, what does that mean? You know, because we, we hear that having not experienced it. What is more real than this? Well, the be best way I can explain it is that, okay, so your flesh is not there, but your spirit is there. But your spirit is more alive inside of you than your flesh is alive. Mm. And your spirit, spirit never dies. So mm. your spirit, it's so real. It's, it can't be explained in, I, I don't think, I don't know if you can explain it. I mean, it's hard to, exp yeah. it's hard to put it in words. It's just that your spirit is so alive inside of you. If we realized how much the spirit man was mm -hmm. and how much it is alive inside of us, then that would explain to you exactly what I'm trying to say. If you can yeah. understand that your spirit man becomes alive. And it's like, ah, this is what I look for. Yes, this I've, is what I want. He hearing so many of you guys talk, the only way I've been able to think about it is like, imagine, I, I use an analogy, imagine we're living our lives on a flat black and white painting in this room. And then death is separation. So your two-dimensional form is peeled off into a three-dimensional room of color. And you experience three dimensions of color. And then you're pressed back in and you have to explain this in flat, black and white, two-dimensional terms. Right, and you're, and you're speaking. And so you're, this is more, right. but you're having to explain it in terms that are limiting. Is yes. that? I think you're accurate in that what you're explaining is an expansion of the senses mm -hmm. uh, to a large extent. There's uh, oftentimes what we assimilate uh, in our lives, that is what we remember, recall, is based on the senses, the right. visual senses. Right. The, aroma of something. Those elicit the, the memory that we have of a past occurrence. But in heaven, the senses are exponentially greater than those in this world. That's so when you heard. think of all of those senses now, that senses that we don't experience here, and that evokes uh, a memory of heaven, but also brings us, I think there, Ivan, at least for me, I can say that whenever I go there, I'm there in yes. the spirit, to your point. Yes. I'm there in the spirit because that's my spirit was released. I think that's, to me, the difference between some accounts maybe of those who have had dreams and visions and those of us who actually have right. our body has ceased to exist and we live in accordance with our spirit. Yeah. And that's also why when you were talking earlier about crying, we're much more sensitive. Mm -hmm. You know, once you've gone through that, you become extremely sensitive, right. sensitive to the Holy Spirit, sensitive to all those things. Right. So when you become sensitive to that, yeah, I mean, I'm a big guy, but I sit and cry a lot more than you'll ever imagine. You yeah. know, I just, I just do. That, 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 that takes me where I want to go. Down. So in terms of like personality change, like one of the interesting things that came up in one of our many conversations, Randy, is before your experience, you'd taken a kind of a personality profile and you charted in one area. And after your experience... You charted in a completely different area where all of a sudden you were, you identified on that survey as more empathetic and more loving. And so uh, that's uh, that's the most scientific proof I've been able to get so far of a personality change. But on the other side of your journey, like how did how did each of you guys shift in terms of being more loving, empathetic? Like, who were you before? Who are you now? Randy, we'll my, start. my wife would say <laughs> that I I was a corporate guy, right? You know, in biotech and in pharmaceutical and healthcare industry. Uh, and what, what she would say is after I had my experience, I became, uh, I be, not disillusioned, but I really 
I, I, I felt like that wasn't it for me. You know, right. I had, I had tried to climb the proverbial corporate ladder and I realized the next rung just led to another rung. And I think that paradigm shift, but to your point, Sean, I think the empathy level of empathy, that test you were talking about was a valid, validated test, white papers and all. Mm. And it basically showed that my empathy prior to taking that test was on the low end of that scale. My empathy, uh, having um, experienced, there I go, experienced the love of Jesus. Yeah. yeah. How could I not have the heart of, right. of Jesus? And my empathy and that test was so much higher because I, I empathize with Jesus. Mm. And how he feels. And he felt, he feels. You felt what he felt. I felt what he feel, felt, feels. And, uh, <laughs> and that's indescribable. That is absolutely indescribable. And it's hard to, as you said, Ivan, to contain those emotions because the depth and breadth of, of God's love is so exponentially beyond anything yes. we can hope or imagine. Just don't start crying on me because I'll start doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching over here and I'm just going to I was just looking at Sean's jacket and that yeah. stopped me from <laughs> <laughs> that. Did it, That's so. why I wore it. Well, it's okay. back, back down to reality. <laughs> you can't unsee that. Thank you for that. Ivan, did you, did you experience the Lord in well, the same way? Well, this is what happened is that when I, when I, when the experience happened to me, when, it, when I died and this happened, I was, uh, let's be blunt, I was a jerk, okay? I was an abuser. I didn't care about anybody. I didn't care about anybody's feelings, anybody's emotions. I don't want to talk to you, you know, nothing. I mean, it was just like, I was a total jerk. And when I came back to life, my whole life changed. I sat that night from a little after midnight to 6.30 in the morning in a little green avocado rocking chair with a little fringe around the bottom of it, <laughs> <laughs> and, or tassels, whatever they call it. And I sat in that chair and I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. Now, I was a bachelor, so I, I, the only thing I had was rolls of toilet paper, no Kleenex. So I went through two rolls of toilet paper. Wow. I mean, I cried so much. And even now, when we're talking about it, you know, you got this started. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it just brings something up because my whole life changed instantly. I mean, it's like I was not the same person. When I came back, I was never that person again. And what was it in particular that you think did that? that I was allowed to come back <laughs> and given the chance to really turn my life over to God. Mm. It was the experience I had when I'm in heaven. Well, well, you know, my whole experience is I went to hell first then I went to heaven, but being in heaven and then there in heaven and then uh, everything up there, you know, being able to see Jesus, being able to see the things that are going on, being able to know his glory, being able to understand that to, to awaken the spirit inside of me, you know, mm. that was placed there to begin with. And, yeah, I get real emotional. I've changed the empathy. I see people. I have this compassion I never had. Mm. It's like I was somebody and now I'm somebody different. I'm like, I don't even know who that guy was. Mm. And it's it's completely different. That's wild. Because yeah, a lot of us, you know, we associate love with an action, an emotion. But when you look into the person of love, that's entirely different. So yeah. I remember the light of Jesus just tunneling in into every dark place. Yes. And what... What amazed me in retrospect is that he had shown me in my life reviews uh, both the good and the bad. So I saw the times when I had failed uh, God. And instead of those experiences condemning me, they reflected the grace of Jesus right. in all things. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I wasn't condemned. And I looked at these things and I said, Jesus, really? You forgave that? Mm -hmm. Even that? It just reflects the. Again, the, the love of God, love, and we've been so trivialized, love as yeah. a word, mm -hmm. uh, that we don't understand love as a person. I've, I've heard some of you try to explain it, like, um, imagine, for, for me, or for those watching, <laughs> imagine having, taking all the love you've ever felt on earth, from your mother, from your dad, for your boyfriends or girlfriends or spouse, for your kids putting it all into one moment, multiply that by a thousand, and that just keeps going. Mm. Does that sound, is that what you guys experience? Times, times 100,000 times infinitely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. It, 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 that's not enough. So, yeah, it, yeah. The, the love isn't, oh, wow. And that's the problem. And is it different yeah. than our, I, I've heard it's, it's on a magnitude, it's not, it's not really like, like what we experience the best. It's, it's way beyond that. 
It's it's completely different. It's a different kind of love. Mm. But once you get it, it encompasses all the other types of love. Is it's it like so much you're, you're known fully and accepted fully? What is it that makes it different? Uh, I think that's part of it, yes. It's just, it's hard to explain that type of love because we don't see that here on earth unless it's, we'll, we'll see it in another person sometimes. We'll recognize it. Mm. You know, like I can recognize things in him. He probably recognizes things in me. Because when you meet other people who have been through things like that, you st- there's something different about the person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I would say that I became the person in heaven that I always wanted to be on earth mm. yes. because of that love. I'd always wanted to do good things, but I had this propensity not to do them at times. And what I realized in heaven is release of my body, that in my spirit, my born-again spirit, that I had become that person that I always wanted to be because yeah. I was so consumed mm-hmm. with a Jesus. And I had what Paul talked about, the Christ mindset. Mm-hmm. The Christ ma- mindset was fully engaged in heaven. And so I was seeing through uh, essentially the eyes of Jesus. Mm-hmm. I was not as Jesus, but I was seeing in the same way that he uh, was seeing things and people. And that was entirely different. I, I, I like that. Through the eyes of Jesus. I think that's what it is. You know, some people have talked about a, um, like, when they looked into the eyes of Jesus, it was like he was in, the, his light was in them, or, and they were in him, and it's, it, they try to describe this, this kind of sense of oneness. Did you guys either experience that? I, I saw myself in him. Does that make sense? In other words, I saw me in him. He was in me. Hmm. Not so really. I, well, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. Others, what do you like, mean? In, it's kind of hard to explain. Because words. I've heard that again and again, when, but I don't, I don't understand what it means. When you look at him, you realize that you are a part of that. You're, you know, and, and you're so actually. you come from. Yeah, you come from that. That's where you come from. Uh, That's where the beginning came from. So uh, you were there. And then. So it's like an attachment that you naturally right. have. Kind of like your mom. There's no one else like right. your mom. Super right. attachment. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Just like that. Uh-huh. I, that's how I experienced. Yes. There was this affinity beyond infinity, I guess I would say, that's you know, that, that, yeah. that was, you know, the, um, I never realized somebody could, could love that much. I never realized that there was an ability to love someone that much, where there was nothing else but love. Mm. And I think looking into the eyes of Jesus, when I crashed down to the ground and I was sobbing, I said, Lord, God, my Lord, my God, every superlative I could think of. And he lifted me up. And, and I realized he didn't want me to be bowing down before him. He wanted to look me eye to eye. And my eye, he was lifting me up to look in his face, not, not above him from below, but eye to eye with him. And I felt such honor mm. that he would do that. Um, it's beyond anything. There, was no, there are no words in the English lexicon or any of the lexicons in any, any of the languages. Well, and I, I think something I want to point out is that you hadn't earned that, right? right? I right. mean, because you've told me that's not really, yeah. it's not like you were super Christian or anything. That's it's just right. that's how he feels about all yes. Right. Yeah. That's what Dean Braxton said to me. He said, you know, I looked into his eyes and I felt like I was the only one that mattered. Oh, right. Right. And then he said, but but then I thought of someone else and I realized through him that he feels the same way about them. But I felt like I was the only one that mattered. That's so true. I, you know, I um, thought about the revelations and I wrote about the revelations that I received in heaven. And that was the first one. But God saw me as he saw you, Ivan as though I was the only one in the world, only one in the entire universe. I know the cares of the world were on his shoulders. Mm. However, I have never experienced anyone where their full attention, full devotion was on me. I didn't even think that, that was possible, you know, because most of the time we're distracted by this thought or that thing. And with him was the only time I felt that I had his full devotion and it sounds kind of haughty to say, you know, you're the most important or I'm the most important person in the world. But to your point, I knew that he was seeing others in that same way. Mm-hmm. And only God could do that. Mm-hmm. And that was the most amazing epiphany 
that God is so great mm-hmm. that he can value us singular, singularly, that is, as, as if we're the only person in the world, and yet he does so to every other person. Well, one of the things I've noted in the last few months is Randy and I have had so many conversations with near-death experiencers is some of the things, as, we, as we've talked about, they're specifically for the person having the experience, but then there can be other things where it's really from a ministry perspective onto other people yeah. that you're going to share these stories with. And I, I think of your story, Ivan, and Jim Woodford's story as well. You both saw, like uh, Jim describes it as seeing a nursery in heaven, but you also see lost children in heaven who are reunited with parents. People are getting to reconnect and see their kids even grow up, if you will. Yes. And that's, I'd love to have you just speaking to that a little bit of, yeah, I feel like that was something God gave you that's a blessing and a ministry unto other people. It wasn't necessarily for you. Yes, it wasn't for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's for any, you know, for every single aborted child that's out there, it's, that was in the mother's womb. They're in heaven. Every stillborn, every, every miscarriage, every one of them are in heaven. Everyone that died prematurely are in heaven. And so what happens is that when the parent gets to heaven, that child meets that parent. Now, here's the thing that I thought was really unique, is that as that parent comes into heaven, how they in their mind picture what they want that child to be, whether it's an infant or whether it's a three-year-old or a six-year-old or whatever, that's what they get when they get there because God already knows that's what they, that's what they need to see. And so that's what's there. And so, so then... They see that child, and that child is with them in heaven. Now, the unique thing about it, though, is that the child knows, has the same language as the parent, knows everything, can speak, can, you know, whatever. And it, because it's in the spirit, it has all knowledge, all knowing, and it can speak, it can do whatever. But it's still, the love is there, even though you're not married in heaven or anything like that, but you still recognize people, and that love is just so mm-hmm. strong because that parent coming there that was something that they missed on earth, but God's letting them have that in heaven. Mm-hmm. That's biblical. I mean, David, when he lost his, his child, he said, you know, I'm not going to mourn anymore. I, I, he won't come back to me, but I will go to him. Right. Right. And David had an expectation of, of heaven. So. Yeah. I had a conversation with a young man earlier <laughs> that, um, diagrammed something that I had seen in heaven in my book, written into my book, uh, was a column, uh, flowing columns and children, uh, as you saw, Ivan, that had either um, not grown up in this world or had been aborted or what have you, but they were, uh, there was, they were on a field, like a flowing field of linen and these columns above. And uh, they had the angels, you know, it was kind of like a, bouncy, but a more elegant bouncy. The angels were there playing with them. So the they were frolicking about as children will do. And I realized something, and that is, and I had asked the Lord, you know, what is that about? And he said, I've given them the childhood that was deprived of them in this in the world. Wow. Well, that's what I saw too. So that's you can make me cry now. <laughs> you saw this because I never heard anybody else say that. And if and, I tried and, to explain that it would be ridiculous. So what, what, say it, say it. What it, it was, it's like, it, it's like this huge, I, it's beyond the field, but like linen, like he was talking about, it was very soft. Like they were it, on the linen. Well, yeah, they were there. They were just, it was just sweet. It was beautiful. And they were given a childhood mm-hmm. that they never had on earth. Mm-hmm. And to try to tell people that, you know, so uh, thank you. <laughs> and it was confirmed so, by this young man who yeah. had dialed and he showed me the picture and he said, I, drew this before I I read your book and it was um, the same. So really, yeah. He had a vision of that. Yes. And he he drew it out. Yes. Well, I've heard, I've heard many say this, the same thing you guys are saying. And even that there are schools where they, they have to learn what they didn't get to learn on earth about the necessity of Jesus sacrifice, you know? And I think what I've come to conclude that, you know, like you guys are saying, in heaven, we're we're like Superman. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> yes. we have fifty senses, not just right. five senses. Yes. And so I tend to think that God has put us in this life for a time, and it's actually a reduced experience of what we were created for. Right. So that we think we think the suffering is horrible, but it's not. It's actually God's mercy 
and a warning to choose him. And we're learning in the knowledge of both good and evil. Right. You know, that's and 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 we're learning why choosing Jesus and his will and way is, is so important because the angels were innocent and they rebelled. But the innocent angels are still innocent. And yet I, I think God probably is why he assigns them to watch over and minister to us, but also record our lives. They're learning without sinning. Why not to sin? Why to follow God's will? Yeah. You know, and why Jesus' sacrifice was necessary. And you know what's interesting about that, John, is that the angels were not like the humans, like you or, or me. Uh, the angels were otherworldly looking. Hmm. They were had you no know, form, but they had they they looked gargantuan in height. But those in heaven. Uh, were those who had gone that were the children of the Lord, those humans, they reflected the the image of Christ. So I even noticed, I mean, I don't know if this is your case as well, that the angels paid a sort of homage to those who were you and I. That is, uh, they were in service to you and I. And I thought that was... Um, incredible in itself, because I thought I would, I looked at them and I thought they were almost worthy of adoration themselves, you right. know, but I realized I was in the midst of Jesus who looked very common and did not have this gargantuan, this otherworldly appearance. He looked like me in many mm. respects. And that, that just blew my mind that that was the, the case that, yeah. We were created in his image. We are. Yeah. And they are huge. <laughs> I tried to write, you know, because, you know, you don't go around with a measuring stick, but it's like, like the angel that greeted me when I got to heaven. I, I say he's seven foot tall. He's probably taller than that, but it's just huge. Yeah. But, and the voice when he spoke, I say he, because it looked like a guy, the voice when he spoke had such power mm. to it, made me recognize when we start reading in the Bible and start realizing that God made us in his image and his likeness, our voice has power. Mm. If we learn something about that, I learned that while I was up there mm. and start thinking about it. But yeah, they're, they're huge. They're different. I, I, I call it, you know, he looked like a guy, you know, but okay. not exactly like a guy. But, but some have said some are our height, some are right. 10 feet, some are 15 there, There's different feet. ones. And, and some have more power. Or they don't know how to describe it. Like, right. Warrior angels versus right. ministering yeah, angels. I, I, saw the, I saw the warring angels initially after I had died. Um, those that were the angels beholding the God and the light of God shone on them. And in the darkness were the demons, the fallen angels, and they were warring against each other. And the only thing I could deduce from that after the fact was that they were warring over my soul. And I knew to cry out the name of Jesus. And it was in that moment that I was ushered uh, into the presence of wow. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then when I, when I uh, was revived, I heard this couple, they were praying for me. And I heard the same song echo that I had heard in heaven just before I departed heaven. And to, as you said, that the sound that reverberated from one angel was exponentially, you know, five, ten times uh, the voice magnitude of of mm -hmm. the of the of me or any other human, but they were reflecting that in worship, right, and, right. and in accordance with what this couple was uh, praying in, wow. in worship. Did you guys hear the music of heaven? Yes, <laughs> it's glorious. <laughs> that, that's a big part of Ivan's. Story. Yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah. The, the music in heaven is just unbelievable. Um, is there's all types of music in heaven. And, right. and then, okay, so I don't really sing here on earth. I mean, I do, but <laughs> my windows are rolled up. <laughs> so, I, I, I used to be able to sing, but for some reason, my voice got deeper and I just can't seem to hit those notes anymore. But in heaven, when I sang with the angels, I sang a perfect pitch. Mm. I blended in, my voice blended in with them. Yeah. And it sounded really good. Yeah. You know? But music is just, I, okay, here's, here's what I know about music. Music was originally from heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who was in charge of music? Lucifer. Okay. Lucifer got kicked out. Right. Yeah. So here's the thing. When we hear music that's praise and worship about God, even if you don't know anything about the Lord and you come into a room and that's going on, 
your spirit wants to do this. Your spirit is like, yeah, because it knows that that's praise and worship. You identify it. You know it. You know Mm -hmm. that because there's an anointing on it. There's everything Mm -hmm. else. When you hear music of the world, you want to move around kind of stupid. You know, you want to move around. You want to dance. So that's the thing is that here's the key to it. Your spirit hears the music before your body does. Mm -hmm. Your spirit knows the music before your body recognizes yeah. the music. Yeah. And so your spirit is like, <gasps> when there's Christian music and it's like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> when it's whirly music. Well, I've always, you know, I've always thought about music is so interesting because universally it's, it's like water, like right. humans somehow need it. Yeah. Right. And then hearing so many of you guys talk about the music of heaven and like, um, I remember Don Piper, who uh, had a near-death experience, pastor who had a near-death experience. He said he heard everything from like a Bach, Beethoven to rock and Queen and all, you know type of music. Right. Like it's and and then other people said it was like hearing a thousand songs in different languages all at the same time and perfectly harmonious, which. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and when, only in heaven is it, and 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 I heard others say things like that. Like there was music uh, being composed of, you know, a genre we wouldn't even understand here on earth. Did you guys? I know that. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was sure, going to say the difference that. being, you know, all of those different genres is that in heaven they are sung or echoed as unto the Lord. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. Whereas here we can sing, you know, whether it be in the shower or whatever. The, right. But there they're echoed as unto the Lord. And I think that's the part for me that was, um, uh, you know, a, a profound revelation is that I had never wanted to praise and worship Jesus as much as I did there. Mm-hmm. I have those moments, you know, I can go into mm-hmm. a service listen to the worship and I'm, you know, hands in the air and all of that. But it was in heaven that I always, always wanted to praise Jesus every second. If you don't mind me speaking into that, it's, here, here's what, here's what I know is that when, and you're talking about that in heaven, that's all you want to do. Mm, yeah. Okay. It's like, you're not interested in the things you were interested in on earth because it's what's in heaven. You just can't help but want to praise and worship. You, yeah. you can't help. And the nice thing about it is that your spirit never sleeps. Even right now, your spirit, you can go to sleep, but your spirit's still wide awake. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and in, and in heaven, when the, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you start worshiping now, I, I have a place in my house, it's called my recliner, that I love putting worship music on and soaking in it to where I can try to bring my mind mm-hmm. to hopefully yeah. catch up with my spirit and try to get that same, mm, you mm-hmm. know, because it's nothing like it. Well, and I think that's an important thing for us non-experiencers to understand, <laughs> because I used to think when, when people say, oh, heaven, it's going to be endless worship service. And I'm a pastor, and that sounded horrible to me. <laughs> like, you know, any, endless anything. <laughs> but, but what I've understood from what you guys have said is, like one person said, worship and praise is bursting out of you. Because there's so much joy, you you couldn't not do that. Right, that is correct. That, it's yeah. it's it's not like we do here. Like, oh, now we should sing. Right. It's like if if I don't let this out, I'm gonna explode. And and what it does is it's let out in everything that we do. Right. So, for example, I felt that every talent, every ability I had was exponentially magnified in heaven because it was it was being done as unto the Lord from the heart of mm. Christ working through me. So I pe- saw people in heaven that weren't just, you know, praise worship. They were always praise and worship, but sometimes their worship was through. I saw an artist who was painting. Sure. Yeah. I saw those who were teaching. I saw these different people who were using their talents and gift, their talents from the world, but they were magnified because all of them were done uh, unto yeah. perfection. It's all worship. Right. Well, and I think that's an important thing for people to understand too, is you know, we, we kind of tend to think of heaven as, well, life is over and now we just be or do, you know. Right. But, but the Lord seemed to indicate, and I've heard a lot of people say, heaven is a very bustling, busy, 
exciting place. People have roles and responsibilities and jobs, but but the job is not like work where we have to go to work. It's more like when you're creating something. Yeah. And you're and you, you know, you're in the zone and you get lost in it. Sure. Is that yes. accurate? And, and the artist I knew, because I was with Jesus at the time, I knew that artist wasn't a Picasso or a Monet, you know, mm-hmm. artist. I knew this person in the world had a very mediocre talent. Mm. But when I looked at this piece of artwork that this person was producing, there's nothing in the Smithsonian Institute that really compared to it. It was so much more glorious. Really, And I knew it was because that person now had been released into the fullness of what God had given that person. And then it, it really applies to everyone in heaven. Yeah, think about that. To be able to use the gifts God's given us to it's it's all an act of worship, mm-hmm. and right. we get to do it for Him, and and the payment is the joy of just God in us it and is. through us, isn't it? It yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, I saw um, a homeless man. I, I didn't know what anyone, the background of anyone really, homeless, rich, poor, whatever. I didn't know that except for the one homeless man. And this the, is in heaven. In, in heaven. And I saw him draped, and he had a purple robe, and he had gold, was adorned in gold. And I thought that was peculiar. So I asked the Lord about it. How did you know he was homeless? And Jesus told me. Uh. Jesus told me he had been homeless in the world. Uh. So I saw, I saw him feeding others in a circle. And I, and I, again, Jesus was imparting these an understanding as I was walking with him throughout heaven. And he said, that as he was served by others in the world, so others will be served hmm. in heaven. Wow. And I realized that they were we- those people that he was feeding were reaping the benefits in heaven hmm. of the service that they'd, they'd, they'd done to the homeless, to those hmm. that were abandoned. Hmm. And that was wow. a tremendous, tremendous sight. Wow. Well, I'm just sad because we got to wrap. We're actually over time for I this part of the conversation. <laughs> I know. We could go on for several hours. Uh, but the place I'd like to land this, though, because I feel like people can get kind of lost in something that Randy shared there. They're like, oh, my goodness, or something that I haven't shared. And they fixate on a part of the story. But I know from a ministry perspective, what each of you want people to hear, um, there's something specific you, you want every person to get from your story. So, Randy, we'll start with you. When people hear you share, you know, yes, you have these amazing things that happen in heaven. But what's the thing you want to make sure every person who encounters you takes away from your heaven experience? I want them to know they have grossly underestimated God's love for them. Grossly underestimated his love. Mm. And I and I say that only not to condemn or to tell anyone that they haven't done enough. I just mean that however high they have gone in their expectation of who God is, it is still minuscule in comparison to actually who he is and that love will go to the ends of the earth and if he were to sacrifice himself just for that one person again right he would do it right ivan what is that one thing for you i i think the one thing for me is is that people need to realize that i I know there was something out where people said heaven's real but it's not just that heaven's real god is real amen you know jesus is real you know these things are real and it's so important for people to understand that, look, there's only one way to get there. And you have to go through that to get there. It's pretty simple. It's pretty easy. And it is, Randy, what you're saying, too. It's a certain type of love. It's beyond what we could ever imagine. And if people can just get this and understand that we have these things, God is going to give us a lot of different things here on earth. But what you get up in heaven is way beyond that. Listen, we're not here for earth we're here for afterwards mm. and i think it's important for people to understand and john i don't want you to feel left out so uh in terms of all the stories that you've collected all the interviews you've done conversations you've had uh, when you share about heaven when you share about these different encounters like what's the thing you really hope people take away whether it's from your book imagine heaven or if they hear you speak what's the thing you want to be sure they capture well i think going off of what these guys <laughs> just said that that love of jesus is available today and he told us, I'm with you always, any minute. And sometimes it doesn't feel that way. 
you know, because we still have to go through the, the, the valleys, but he is. And that walking by faith honors him. It is how we love him back. And it counts not just for this life, it counts in the life to come. That, that we trust in his word and that we walk with his spirit just day by day. That, and, and you can't fail in your purpose, right? Yes. Amen. If you just do that, <laughs> just walk with him. Just listen and respond moment by moment, day by day. Well, I can speak from my own life experience. You can try to avoid your purpose and your destiny, but it comes back around and eventually, <laughs> eventually it finds you. Gentlemen, thank you for a fascinating conversation. Ivan Tuttle, John Burke, Randy Kay, and thank you to you, the audience, for being a part of this episode of Engaging the Supernatural. My prayer is that you got a touch from heaven, that you've captured some element from hope, of hope from heaven, and we hope that it blessed you. We'll see you again soon.